Father, we love you, Lord. We are so thankful, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you bring us to such an incredible passage this morning, Lord God, arguably the most important section of the whole book. Lord, so many believers or those that call themselves Christians struggle the way that they do because they don't understand this. And so, Lord God, we humble ourselves this morning. We look to you. We desire that it would be you through your word that would speak. Lord, we need you, Lord, this morning. I believe as we look out and we see the condition of the world around us, we recognize that we are living in the last days. And if there's ever a time that we need to take serious our relationship with you, it's today. And so, Lord, minister to your people, Lord God. Let me decrease. Let it all be about you this morning. Lord, you be glorified in this place. You minister to your people through your spirit. We need you, Lord. We love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, good morning. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, okay? We begin 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write down verse 1 through 11. That's our text, verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now, I love God's timing. How many of you know God has this exactly where he has this when he has this? I love the Lord's timing because this past Tuesday, in our men's study, we covered a chapter that was entitled, Does Christianity Differ from Other World Religions? Now, talk about a topic, right? It was great. If you missed it, you missed it because it was an awesome time as we talked about Christianity versus Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and even Judaism. And there are so many differences that we learned as we took the time in this chapter that make Christianity different than all of these other religions around us. But there's one main distinction one thing that separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Let me ask you, do you know what that is? Do you know what the biggest difference is between what we believe and what every other religion believes? Well, the answer is that every other religious leader died and they're still buried today. Isn't that right? And when they died, every single one of their claims, every single one of their beliefs or philosophies died with them. But not Jesus. Jesus died. Yes, he did die. Yes, he was buried, but he rose again. Someone say amen. Amen. He rose again. He conquered sin. He conquered the grave. He did what nobody else was ever able to do. And by his resurrection, he proved to the whole world that he is the way the truth, and the life. He separated himself. In other words, every claim that every religion has ever uttered crumbled when their founder died. But Jesus backed it all up. Why can we believe Jesus? Why can we believe the truth of God's word? Because Jesus backed it up. He offers to the world something that no one else can offer. And that is so important. That is something that we need to understand. That the resurrection of Christ is what separates Christianity from every other belief system. Okay? Now, this morning, we're going to talk about the resurrection. Okay? That is our focus this morning. And this is so important because, again, our whole belief system Everything Jesus said, everything we've ever believed, all the hope that we have of one day rising, though we die, we shall live, is all based upon the resurrection. Do you understand, if Jesus didn't die, I'm sorry, if Jesus didn't rise, we have no hope of ever rising. It is his resurrection, it is his Uh, again, uh, rising from the dead that gives hope to us that one day, though we will die, we shall live, as Jesus said. And that's the hope. And that's why we need to understand this. And that's why the Apostle Paul is going to take the time to focus on the resurrection because this is something that every Christian needs to understand. Now, very quickly, as I always do, again, especially for the visitors, 
what have we talked about? We've talked about so much. We've started Corinthians in the beginning of the year. And so what have we covered? Well, remember very quickly, this is a letter, okay? We call it the book of Corinthians. It's a letter. Paul had founded the church of Corinth on his second missionary journey. And then five years later, Paul is in Ephesus, where he started the church of Ephesus. And while he was there, a delegation of people from Corinth came looking for Paul. They were looking for their founder. Why? Because over five years, the church of Corinth had grown, more people, more problems, and so they come looking for their founder to get some answers. They bring him a letter with all these questions. Paul, can you answer all these questions for us? And so Paul's response back is a letter, 1 Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, answering all of their questions. Now, what have we covered so far? Well, if you've been with us, again, if you missed it, you got to go back. Paul talked about <laughs> questions regarding marriage, questions regarding singleness, questions regarding divorce, important questions we need to understand today, even as Christians. How about questions regarding the rights and freedoms that we have in Christ? How about questions regarding worship in the church? Well, the last couple chapters, 12, 13, and 14, were focused on the spiritual gifts that every believer has so that we can use them, again, to advance the kingdom of God. And so question after question, which is so important, this book for every Christian to understand, because we all have questions. How are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? How does God desire us to worship him have been answered in this book? But now we come to chapter 15. And as I mentioned, it's all focused on the resurrection. Now the question is this, and this is really important. Paul is writing to believers, amen? He's writing to Christians in Corinth. Now would you agree with me, they already believed in the resurrection. Would you agree with that? If they didn't believe in the resurrection, then they weren't Christians. So we know they believed in the resurrection. So the question is, why is Paul taking the time to clarify the resurrection to people who already believed in the resurrection. We need to understand this. Let me explain why. The Greeks, remember Corinth is in ancient Greece. The Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, for example, never believed in a physical resurrection. They believed that's foolishness. They would say, that's absurd. Uh, someone rising from the dead? Are you crazy? And remember, these were the intellectuals. These were the educated, right, of all people. Remember, back then, Athens was basically the most intellectual place on planet Earth, okay, during this time. Well, remember what happened. If you remember the story, Book of Acts, Paul comes to Athens, and Paul is bringing the gospel to Athens. He went to Athens before he went to Corinth, you might remember. What happened? Paul comes, and on Mars Hill, which is where all the intellectuals gathered together to exchange their philosophies, Paul confronts them with the gospel. Incredible passage in the book of Acts. Let me just remind you very quickly what happened. Paul is conversating with them. Acts 17, 31, he explains that because he, speaking of God, has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man Jesus whom he has ordained. Paul is breaking it down, explaining that we need Christ, we need to trust in Christ because we're all sinners and one day we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Very important for all of us to understand. He's explaining this to them. Then he says, he has given assurance to this. He's, God has made it clear. He's assured us that his word is true by rising Christ from the dead. Again, what separates Christianity from every other religion? Christ rise, rose from the dead. That's what Paul said. How did they respond? These are the educated, the most educated. Verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, what does it say? They laughed at Paul. They were basically, come over here telling us that stuff. And they mocked him. Now what's sad about it is, you remember what happened in Athens? Did Paul plant a church in Athens? No. Is there a letter to the church of Athens anywhere? 
What's so sad is remember, Paul went to all these places. He went to Philippi. He went to Thessalonica. He went to Berea. Plants all these church after church because they're believing. But when he comes to Athens, they were too sophisticated. They were too intellectual and they disregarded the gospel. So what did Paul do? Paul left. And Paul continued journeying south and he stops at the next big city, which was Corinth. And he starts the church of Corinth. Now this is important, again, to keep in the back of your mind because the Greeks did not believe in a literal or bodily resurrection. So what did they believe? You gotta understand this stuff. The Greek philosophers taught that all matter was evil. All matter was evil. Everything on the outside was evil and only the spirit was good. This is what they believed. It doesn't matter how you live, you can sin, it doesn't matter because all matter, your flesh, your body is sinful anyways. The only thing that is good is your spirit. And so what they believed was that if there was a resurrection, it was not a physical resurrection, this evil body's not gonna rise again, your spirit would be resurrected. Your soul would experience, again, new life. And so what this meant is when they heard of a resurrection in their mind, it wasn't physical. It was spiritual. They began to believe that Jesus could not have risen physically because all matter is evil. So Jesus had to rise spiritually. And what this began to do was infiltrate the church. They began to question, maybe Jesus didn't rise physically. Maybe the philosophers, the most educated among us, were right. Maybe he only rose spiritually. Now think about it. If Jesus only rose spiritually and not physically, what does that mean for us? That means that we too will only rise spiritually and not physically. Are you with me? At the moment of salvation, when we trust in Christ, we are born again. Amen? Amen. Our spirits are made new. Our spirits are made alive. We experience a spiritual resurrection. But because Christ raised physically, we also have the hope that one day we will rise physically too. But what if we start believing that it's only spiritual? That means what? That means that even Christians don't have anything to look forward to. And this mindset began to spread within the church. Now think about it. One of the awesome things, one of the awesome hopes that we have as Christians is knowing that though we die, we will live. Amen? How many of you know that at a, at a Christian memorial, right, at a funeral, when we talk about our belief in Christ, the glory, you know, the, the hope, the encouragement we have is that when we are absent from the body, we are what? We are present with the Lord. That's the hope we have. Because we know and believe in a physical resurrection. But if you take that away, if you say there is no physical resurrection, then guess what? Christianity is no different than any other religion. Does that make sense? That means that we, as Christians, offer no different hope than what any other belief out there offers. And that is what began to happen. So you imagine you're an unbeliever, you're you're curious, you come to the Corinthian church, and then someone tells you, well, there's really not a physical resurrection, it's only spiritual. You would say, then what's the difference? Then why am I here? Then why should I trust in Jesus? And that is exactly what began to take place, which again leads Paul to have to address this, to make sure that any believers that were starting to be confused would understand that no, there is a resurrection, a physical resurrection indeed. Someone say amen? Very, very important. This morning again, Paul's going to give us the fact of Christ's resurrection. How can we know for sure? What evidence do we have that a physical resurrection happened? If you're taking notes, again, he's going to give us three evidences. Three evidences for the reality of Christ's 
resurrection. Write this down. It'll help you again. Put it all together. What's the first evidence? What's the first proof that we have that the resurrection of Christ is true indeed? And the first thing is the testimony of the church. Okay, write that down. Very important. It is the testimony of the church. Paul begins verse 1, and he says, now, I would remind you. He's reminding them because they knew this already. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received. If you have a pen or highlighter, underline, you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you have a pen or highlighter, underline, being saved. Very important. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul begins, again, this section by reminding the church that they already believe the gospel. When he first came to them, this is what he gave them. This is the message that he taught them. Now remember what the word gospel means. It means good tidings. We would say today, good news. And that is good news that Christ has risen, amen? Good news that because Christ rose, one day we will rise too. That's good news. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. That's good news. I don't know about you. We should be excited about that, right? Praise the Lord, right? Now, when Paul came and he preached the good news, what happened? Did they, did they believe it? Did they receive it? That's what Paul says they did. Now, remember, Paul will later write in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, hearing what? The good news. That's how we get saved, right? Is that how it starts? We need to hear the good news. We need to be sharing the good news. It's the only way people can be saved. And so Paul is reminding them what happened. Don't you guys remember? I first came to you. I shared the gospel with you. You heard it. You believed it. You received it. And you were saved. And presently, you are standing on that belief. Paul recognized, this is what you guys believed. And this is what I know you guys are continuing to believe. Now what's beautiful about this is, this is what should be happening in every church. The gospel is presented, people hear it, faith comes by hearing, they believe it, they receive it, and they are saved. John says in John 1.12, to all that received him, Jesus, To those, God gave the right to become children of God. Amen? John 1, 12, very, very important. This is the same thing that happened in all the churches. It also happened in Thessalonica. Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, it's not just enough to hear it, right? You have to believe it. You have to allow it to enter your heart, not just your mind, not just through one ear and out the other. You have to receive it. When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. How many people hear the gospel and they reject it? How many hear the gospel, but it makes no difference in their heart and mind? In order to be saved, we must hear it, we must believe it, we must receive it. Not as the word of man, not man's opinion, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so Paul's reminding them what happened. Don't forget, guys, I came to you, I shared the gospel, you heard it, you believed it, you got saved, and you're standing on that truth. You continue to believe the truth that I gave you. But notice what he does. This is important. He cautions them about something. Look back at what he says. He says, verse 2, and by which you are being saved, if, notice the if, it's conditional. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you. Paul says, look, I believed that you are genuine. I believe that you heard the gospel and were saved. I believe that. But what's going to prove if this really happened is if you hold on to 
the gospel that I delivered to you. In other words, them continuing to believe in the gospel is what demonstrates that they truly are saved. Continuing to believe. What did Jesus say? Jesus said in, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 3.14 first, for we have become partakers of Christ, notice the if, if we hold the beginning, if we hold on to the gospel we heard at the beginning, the confidence steadfast until the end. I love this. As Christians, every single one of us has the responsibility not only to hear and believe, but to continue to believe. What happens if we stop believing? What happens, again, if we walk away and begin to believe something else? And this is why Paul addresses this. Jesus said, here's the verse, John 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if, conditional, you hold to my teaching, you are truly my disciples. Now what happens if someone believes the word of God, but then they stop believing? What if they stop holding to the teachings of Christ? What does that mean? It means they are not his disciples. And this is why Paul said what he said. Look back at what he said. He said, unless you believed in vain. Now, this is so sad. Because how many of you have ever met people, I'm sure we all know someone, who at one time believed the gospel? At one time, again, they trusted in Christ as their Savior, but today they're back out in the world. Do we know people like that? Again, we're not being mean, we're not judging, we're, I'm simply stating a fact. People that came, and over the years, I've seen so many people come in so excited, right, crying that God had touched them and changed their life, and six months later, they're back out in the world. Well, what happened? I thought you believed. I thought you trusted in Christ. I thought you accepted him as your Lord. Lord means master. What happened? I don't believe that anymore. I just, you know... And they have their reasons or they have their excuses. Well, in this case, some of the Corinthians began to doubt the resurrection. Paul, I don't know if he really rose physically. Maybe it was just a spiritual resurrection. And they began deviating, no longer believing in the gospel message that they once believed. And so, think about it. If you believed the gospel at one time, but no longer believe it, is the gospel going to do you any good on judgment day? No. You believed it for nothing. That's what Paul said. You believed it for nothing. How many people, and it is sad because I've run into so many of them, at one time were water baptized or said the sinner's prayer, or you name it, came to church. But now, again, are no longer living for Christ. They're living back in the world for themselves. Do you think they're going to be able to stand before God and say, God, but, but I said a prayer. God, but I came to church. God, but I was water baptized. And that's supposed to mean something? What did Jesus say? Many will come to me on that great day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? And Jesus said, what? I will turn to them and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. And this is why Paul gives us this warning. Look back at what it says. I think this is so important. Again, don't miss this. He says, and by which you are being saved, if, if you hold fast, if you hold on to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Every single person, every single one of us has the responsibility not only to hear and to believe and to receive Christ personally, but guess what? We also have that responsibility to continue to believe. You know, there's so much garbage out there. Wouldn't you agree with that? So much garbage. You know, what's so sad today, especially, is you see so many young people raised in church their whole life, taught the gospel. And then what happens? They go off to college. 
and they are bombarded by so much garbage and they are brainwashed with the lies of Satan and then what happens? They no longer believe that. Oh, I know my parents taught me that, but I don't believe that anymore. Now they're educated. Now they're more sophisticated. And they don't believe that ancient book of fairy tales. Isn't that sad? It's sad, but it's real. That's what's happening. And that's why Paul warns, if, if you continue to believe. Now what I love about this is Paul's going, on, going to go on in the next book to make this statement. He's going to challenge them. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says that every single one of us better what? Examine ourselves. You know, one of the sad things that happens in so many people is we like examining other people. We pay more attention to brother so-and-so and what he's doing or what he's not doing than we should. And Paul says, you better knock that off. You better look in the mirror. One day when you stand before God, you're going to be all by yourself. So don't, 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 think, don't worry about anybody else. You better focus on your own self. You better examine yourself to see, to check whether you really are in the faith. How many people come to church, but that's all that they do. They just come to church. They're not really saved. They're not really in the faith. They really have not surrendered and accepted Christ. And their life demonstrates it. And that's why he says, you better test yourself. You better look at your own heart. You better look in the mirror and look at your own life. Do you not realize this about yourself? Have you learned anything? Do you recognize what or how you are living? That Christ, is is, is he really in you? I mean, you say he is. You call yourself a Christian, but are you really in Christ? Are you really saved? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Every single one of us has that responsibility to check ourselves before before we wreck ourselves. That's the bottom line. We better look in the mirror. We, We better see if we pass the test. Now how do we know what evidence will we demonstrate in our life if we truly are Christian? Well, Jesus said what? You will know them by their... Right? Our life will be different. Our life will be different. If you truly are filled with the Spirit of God, your life will be different. You will no longer be that person that you once were because you're filled with the Spirit of the living God. And if you are filled with the Spirit, if you are in Christ, you know what will be happening in your life? You will be changing. You'll be changing. You will not stay the same person that you are. Because God lives in you. And this is so important for all of us to understand. You know, the beauty is that when God is living within you, you cannot live the way you once did. Oh, you might be tempted. We're all tempted, but you recognize God is living within you now. And day by day, as we continue to serve God, as we continue to allow our minds to be washed with the water of God's word, God will be doing a work in our lives. That's what Paul says, right? That he who begun that good work in you is going to what? He's going to finish that work. It's a process. You know, so often people want to say, oh, Christians, you know, they think they're so perfect. You know, they they think they're so holy. You know what? I know who I am. You don't have to tell me. I know who I am. But you know what's so beautiful? And the reason that brings me comfort that God is at work in my life? Because he's changing me. Because he's changing me. And the longer that I serve Jesus, he is drawing me closer to him and he is separating me more and more and more from this world. That's the evidence. That's the evidence. My life is changing. And guess what? Your life should be changing, which means if it's not, if you're still sinning and living the way you always have and there's no change in your life, are you really saved? Are you really filled with the Spirit of God or are you just coming to church? Because that is so common in this world. Always remember, a Christian still sins. 
We will continue to sin because we struggle with a fallen sinful nature until the Lord takes us home. But a true Christian, although we will continue to sin, we will sin less and less and less the closer we get to Christ, the longer we live for God. Because God's living in us, because God is at work changing us. And this is what Paul says. Look back at what he says, by which you are being saved. That's why Paul said that. Now you look at me and say, wait, 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 Pastor, I thought, <laughs> I thought when I trusted in Christ, he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I thought I'm already saved. And the answer is, yes, you are, if you did that. Yes, you are. But although you were saved at the moment, right? You called upon the name of the Lord. You believed in the Lord Jesus. Positionally, you are saved. In other words, God looks at you and he sees you covered in the blood of Jesus. He sees your sins washed away that so, you, so that you are saved. But at the same time, because God is continually changing us and doing a work in our hearts, we are being saved. If you were with us when we covered the book of Romans, we talked about the process of sanctification. As God is continually working in us, changing us, making us more and more like Jesus. That's how you know you're genuine. That's how you know you pass the test when God is changing you. Which means what? If you look at your life, if you look in the mirror, and you're still not changing you're still doing the same things you've always done, then you're probably not a Christian. You're probably just coming to church. And that's why we have these words. Now, remember, Paul made it clear, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, what happens? Say it again. They're new. They're new. New. The old things, what happened? They're gone. Does it mean we're not tempted by the old things? We'll we'll always be tempted by these old things. We live in a fallen world. But more and more as we get closer to God, we're going to give in to those things less and less and less because we're going to be desiring more and more and more Jesus Christ. Now the beauty in this is that Jesus was raised in the newness of life. Someone say amen. He was raised in the newness of life, which means his followers at the moment of salvation were also spiritually raised in the newness of life. We are to be following in his example, living a new life in Christ, not the old one, which again is proof that Jesus was raised from the dead. Think about this. If Jesus wasn't raised, could he change anybody? No, the fact that he was raised proves that he's alive, and the fact that he's alive proves that he has the ability to make us alive. Someone say amen to that? Now, this is what's awesome. I love this so much. There have been many people in my life, and I'm sure the same with you, they don't want to believe God, they don't want to listen to God, they don't want to believe the Bible, and they want to argue with you as to why they don't want to be a Christian, why they don't want to trust in Christ. And people can argue, they can believe whatever they want, right? We're all free moral agents. But although they can argue all of these things, you know what someone can never argue? The change that God has done in your life. No one can ever take that away from you, okay? Always remember that. And this is what Paul means. That the change in our life, there are so many stories. I think about my dad, for example battled with heroin for as long as I can remember, had been through every program you can imagine along with prison for I don't know how many years. Nothing could change him except Christ. And the work that God did in his life gives evidence that our God's alive, that our God truly has risen from the dead. Someone say amen. And so let's move on. First thing was the testimony of the church, the testimony of the salvation that God has brought to those that believe in him. But there's a second testimony, and that's the testimony of the scriptures, because they also validate the truth of the resurrection. Verse three, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. 
Now, I love this. Again, Paul is giving evidences that the resurrection is true. And Paul reminds him, look, when I first came to you, when I first arrived at Corinth, I gave you the most important thing. That's what he says. What was the most important thing? The gospel. That's what they received. And Paul says, this is really neat, look what he says, what I also received. Now this statement by Paul is important because he wants to clarify to anyone who thinks he came up with this. Paul says, I didn't come up with it. I'm not giving you the gospel according to Paul. I received this myself. I received this myself. Now, I love this, and I think this is really, really cool. If you know the life of Paul, we studied the book of Acts a couple years ago. Was Paul a believer? Prior to, prior to meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, was Paul a believer? No, he was a persecutor of the church, wasn't he? Did, he? did he believe Jesus rose from the dead? Of course not. Even after Jesus was dead, what was Paul doing? He was hunting down Christians, wasn't he? He was the last person we would say to believe in Jesus. He was the last person to believe that Jesus rose from the dead until he seen Jesus himself alive, Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. Then he was different. Now, this is important because, again, Paul didn't come up with this gospel. It was not Paul's gospel. Paul also wasn't taught the gospel from someone else. Now, that's kind of interesting, right? Where did he get the gospel from? Well, he tells us where he got the gospel from. In Galatians 1, 11, and 12, Paul says, But I make known to you, brothers and sisters, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. It did not come from man. It is not of human origin. For I neither received it from man, not from Paul, uh, not, not from John, not from Peter, right? not from any of the apostles, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? Jesus gave it to him. Jesus taught him the gospel. Now what's beautiful is in the next two verses, he's going to give us the gospel. These are the two probably most important verses in the whole book, okay? But before we get into the gospel itself, what makes these next words so special? This is that point in the message where your mind goes like this. If I were to ask you today, how do we know what happened to Jesus? How, how do we know? You would all probably open your Bible and say, well, Matthew tells us, or Mark tells us, and Luke tells us, and John tells us, right? Because we have the four Gospels. And that's awesome. Praise the Lord. But when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Corinthians was one of the first books of the New Testament written. In other words, when Paul wrote this letter, none of the Gospels had even been written yet. None of them. There was no recorded record of Scripture uh, of the resurrection written yet. And so that's what makes Paul's words, I received it from Christ, so believable. Later on, of course, the Gospels will be written and we have the benefit of them today. But at this point, Paul is about to give us the first recorded record of the gospel. So beautiful. Look what he writes down. He says that Christ died for our sins <coughs> in accordance with the scriptures. We know that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, died for our sins, didn't he? Did he die for his sins? Did he die for his sins? No, he died for our sins. Jesus was perfect. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves, thereby satisfying the righteous standard of God. But none of us can do that. None of us have ever done that. No person has ever been able to do that. We are all lawbreakers. None of us are able to live up to the standard of God because we're sinners. 
Therefore, Christ had to die for our sins. He died on purpose. He died for a purpose. To pay the price for the wages of sin. What's the wages of sin? Death. Therefore, Christ died for our sins. We are all sinners. We are all born sinners. And we sin against holy God every day. Our sin will keep us away from the presence of God forever. That's why anyone who dies, anyone who has ever died, apart from receiving the forgiveness offered by Christ, is separated from God throughout all eternity. That's why Jesus had to die. That's the gospel. Verse 4, that he was buried. Now I love that. Someone would say, why? What's so important about that? Well, let me ask you. Do you bury people that are alive? Hope not, right? <laughs> you only bury dead people. And so this is proof that he died, okay? The fact that the Romans who were experts in death and crucifixion knew he was dead. And they buried him in a tomb that was guarded by unbelieving Roman soldiers. Isn't that right? That's important to understand. Keep going. That he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scriptures. After dying, something that was public, everybody saw it, everybody knew it, the Romans would have not taken him off that cross. Had he not died, they stabbed him with a spear just to make sure. He was buried, and then on the third day, on Sunday, he rose again, right? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. When he rose again, it was a sign to the whole world that he had conquered sin and death. That's what it was. It was a sign to the whole world, to anyone who did not believe in him, that he truly was everything he said he was. And his resurrection, as I already stated, validated that every word he said was true. He backed it up by rising from the dead. Now, anyone after the resurrection who visited his tomb found an, an empty tomb. Isn't that awesome? I've been to Israel several times, and let me tell you, he's not there. He is not there. Now, for any critics, even critics back then, the Romans, the unbelieving Jews, all they had to do was to produce a body. Isn't that right? If they would have produced a body, guess what? Then they could have proven that the gospel was a lie. They could have destroyed Christianity simply by producing a body. But were they able to do that? No. Because he truly had risen indeed. Now this is the gospel. What is the gospel? It is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's that simple. Understanding the truth of the gospel. But notice again what Paul says. Look back. He says it twice. That all of this took place in accordance with the scriptures. You guys see that? That is important. Why does Paul take the time to clarify it? Because he wants to show us that all this was prophesied. This was not an accident. Christ died on purpose. He died for a purpose. He died to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. And when he fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, it validated that all of this was true. That all of this was true. Now, there are so many scriptures I could have given you. As I thought about this, as I always do, I try to put myself in Paul's shoes. When Paul made this statement in accordance with the scriptures, what scriptures was he talking about, right? Well, let me just give you a couple of them, okay? I'm going to go quick because we don't have a lot of time. Paul was likely talking about Isaiah 53. Understand, Isaiah was written 750 years before Jesus was born in a manger. Verse 6 or verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 7, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Verse 8, he was cut off from the land of the living. All of this prophecy about Christ. Isaiah 10 through 12, you make his soul an offering for sin. Verse 12, he poured out his soul unto death. He bore the sin of many. Again, all of this was prophesied of what Christ would accomplish. Isaiah 53, 9, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. 
Joseph of Arimathea. Psalm 1610, for you will not leave my soul in the grave, nor will you allow your holy one to see corruption. Jesus' body never never decayed because it was not in the grave long enough. Matthew 12, 39, Jesus answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40, Jesus speaking, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the valley of the great fish, according to Jonah 1.17, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All of it, again, validated. All of it proving that Jesus was prophesied. All these things were to take place, including the resurrection, and Jesus fulfilled it all. Which is why, again, Paul brings up the testimony of the scriptures which validate the reality of the resurrection. But there's a last one, verse three, or number three, the last one, the testimony of eyewitnesses. The testimony of eyewitnesses. Verse five, and that Jesus appeared to Cephas. Who was Cephas? Peter. Then to the 12 apostles, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive. And if you have a pen, underline that phrase, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now remember, Paul has taken the time to give us evidences that we can trust the resurrection really happened. Any good lawyer today will tell you that if they have eyewitnesses, they can prove their case, right? right? Eyewitnesses mean everything. I mean, you have people that were there that saw it, case closed, it, it's over, it's proven. And so that's what Paul does, right? He gave us the testimony of the changed lives of believers in the church. He gave us the testimony of the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. And now he says, and how about the eyewitnesses? How about all the people that seen Jesus? All of them testify that the resurrection is not make-believe, the resurrection is not fairy tale, it's not (laughs) Greek mythology, but what? It is true, it is real, it is an actual historical event. Everybody's seen him die, that's no question. But they also seen him alive after he had died. Now Paul mentions, right, first Jesus appeared to Peter, Then he appeared to the the 12 in the upper room. We know about that, right? Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Now, this is beautiful. Can you imagine over 500 people seeing Jesus alive at one time? It's possible that this took place in Galilee. Jesus told the disciples to go to Galilee and he will meet them there. Or this could be referring to The Mount of Olives is when Jesus ascended back up into heaven, right? Whatever the case, over 500 people were there who saw him. Now, interesting. Paul writes this letter, 1 Corinthians, in 55 AD, which tells us it was about 25 years after the resurrection. Now, 25 years is a long time, but it's not that long, right? It's not that long. And that's why Paul says, look back, most of these 500 people are still alive. Now, why would Paul mention that? Why would Paul take the time to bring it up? Though some have died, though some have fallen asleep. This is important because you always have skeptics. You always have critics that go, I don't believe that. Paul, I think you're lying to me. And Paul says what? A lot of these people are still alive. You can go and ask them yourself. You doubt anything that I'm saying, although some of them have died over these 25 years, there's still a lot of them that are alive, and they can testify that they saw Jesus alive. Keep going, verse 7. Then, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Now, this is important. Paul just gave us a list of all the believers that saw him after he had died. But now he says, he also appeared to James and to me. Now, why is this special? 
Well, number one, understand that this is not James, John's brother. This is James, Jesus's half-brother. Now, the reason this is important is if you remember the Gospels, Jesus' brothers didn't believe he was the Messiah. Remember that? They rejected him. But sometime after the resurrection, Paul says that Jesus appeared to his brother James, and when his brother seen his own brother having risen from the dead, he knew he was the Christ after all. What happened to James? Well, a lot happened to James. Not only did James become the pastor of the Christian church in Ephesus, according to the book, I'm sorry, Christian church in Jerusalem, according to the book of Acts, I think it's 15, but he also went on to give us the book of James. Powerful. Now, why does he bring him up? Well, he brings him up and he brings himself up. And Jesus also appeared to me. What did James and Paul have in common? They were both unbelievers until after they seen Jesus after the resurrection. Now that's important, why? Because people would say this. How many of you heard people say this? Well, I just think the Peter and John, I think they just saw what they wanted to see. He says, no, no. Jesus just didn't appear to believers. He appeared to unbelievers so that they could never say that. He appeared to believers and unbelievers alike. Let's wrap it up. Verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Now remember, we already talked about it. Paul was an unbeliever. And Paul persecuted the church of God, didn't he? He hunted down, had Christians locked up, had Christians killed like Stephen. Paul never forgot the sinner that he was. And that's important for all of us, that we never forget the sinner that we were. So he felt unworthy. Again, maybe whenever his pride rose, he reminded himself of the sinner that he was. And I think it kept him humble. And that's why he always felt unworthy to be an apostle. But even though he felt guilty over his past, being so grateful for what Christ had done in forgiving him, he lived the rest of his life in the service of God. Now, I love this. This is such an awesome lesson for us. When you truly have experienced the mercy and forgiveness of God, It'll change you. You'll be so thankful. Your life will be changed when you recognize what God has done for you. That in gratitude, you won't be forced to do anything for God. You will want to do something for God. And that's why Paul said, I worked harder than all the other apostles. Now that's powerful, but we know it's true. If you read the book of Acts, you know that Paul sacrificed more. Paul traveled more, Paul suffered more, Paul wrote more books, Paul founded more churches, didn't he? So grateful for all that God had done for him. So important. James says in our last verse, James 2, 18 to 20, James talks about the fact that faith without works is dead. Any true faith that we have will always be backed up by the work that we do in the service to our God, which is why if we have no works, we have to question if we really have faith. And that's what James says in James 2, 18 to 20, verse 11, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Paul wraps up this first section by stating This is the gospel. This is the truth. The resurrection is true. That's why I preached it. That's why all the other apostles have preached the same thing. Because that's the truth. It doesn't matter who preaches it. The messenger doesn't matter. It's the message that matters. And that's why we preach this message. And as you heard and believed and received the gospel, that's why you are saved. This morning I pray you understand that there is evidence for the resurrection. We have no reason to doubt. Again, 
All we got to do is look at our lives. All we got to do is look at the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. All we got to do is recognize the historical eyewitness that bear truth that Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you this morning as always for your word. It's your word. All glory to you, Lord. You alone are worthy. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the the comfort. We thank you for the encouragement. We thank you for the hope that we find, Lord God, in you. Thank you for the gospel message. Thank you, Lord God, that as we trust in our Savior, who did for us what we could never do for ourselves, we could find forgiveness. We could find, Lord God, the hope of heaven, not because we deserve it, not because we can earn it in any way, shape, or form. Lord, you did everything for us. May we live lives eternally grateful, and may it be reflected in the life that we live today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let's stand.